I am uh, Dr. Kelly Vineyard. I have been uh, with Purina for 13 years and uh, I'm a horse person. And so um, not only do I you know, have my PhD in equine nutrition um, from the University of Florida, uh, my bachelor's in animal nutrition from Auburn University, um, and I, but I'm also a, a rider and uh, a horse enthusiast myself. Here's a couple photos of me on my um, horse, Roman, who I um, rode and earned my USDF bronze and silver medals on um, prior to my brand new horse that I have, which I, even, I don't even have a picture of him yet. I just bought him a month ago. Um, he's a lot bigger than this guy. He's an 18 hand horse. Roman was 15, three. So I went from one extreme to the other, but um, so anyway, that's just a little bit about me. Um, I do ride dressage now, but I've, I've done a lot of other um, other things in my my past. So performance horses, though, are a passion of mine and a special interest. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight um, is specifically, you know, feeding performance horses, um, how their needs differ, how they're similar and, you know, specifically for what you are doing, competitive trail riding, you know, that you, uh, your horses are performance horses also, you know, you might not be jumping over crazy obstacles like the three-day adventures do, or, you know, trying to run as fast as you can, like the, the horses on the racetrack are, but you're certainly trying to get the most out of your horse um, when you're out, you know, on the trail and you want them to be able to, you know, complete the day's work, feel good and be able to come back the next day and feel just as good. So when we are talking about feeding these horses and supporting athletic performance, I kind of break it down into these um, to five goals, right? So the first goal that you have when you're feeding a performance horse is you want to meet their nutritional requirements. Every horse, you know, has a set nutrient requirements. We have a book called the NRC put out by the National Research Council. It's basically all the research that's ever been done on horse nutrition kind of compiled into one, um, one document. And that's how we know, you know, what the nu nutrient requirements are. And then we also want to maintain good body condition score, you know, not too fat, not too thin, that type of thing. And most of the time we're aiming for a body condition score of five in our performance horses, um, give or take a little, depending on what you're doing. And then once you meet that goal, we want to make sure we're giving them the right fuel for the job. And this is where it's going to differ depending on what you do with your horse. Um, the race horse requires different fuel than the long distance, you know, endurance horse or trail horse. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then next, we want to make sure we're supporting tissue growth, uh, mostly muscle, because when you're talking about athletes, you're constantly breaking down and building muscle um, adaptation. So that would be both, you know, uh, bone and ligaments and then repair of any damage that can occur. And then really importantly for horses that are sweating while they're um, exercising is replenishing lost electrolytes. We have to definitely pay attention to that. And then finally, just in general, you know, sound feeding management, making sure that, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything to prevent, you know, problems like colic or just making sure that, you know, the digestive system is working the way it's supposed to. So let's talk about meeting requirements and maintaining body condition. Um, so this is a great graph. When you think about nutrient requirements, um, you know, we're talking about things like calcium, phosphorus, copper, zinc, and then amino acids, and even energy um, and nut other nutrients like that. But every nutrient follows this kind of general concept of a bell curve. And most of us think when we're talking about, you know, trying to, we want to maintain this middle ground of optimal intake. And if you're below that middle ground, you're going, and you're deficient, your performance is going to suffer. Um, you get in the optimal range, that's where the performance will be best. And then the same thing, you can have decreased performance if you get too much. So, you know, going up, obviously we, want, we don't want to be deficient. We want to be right there in the sweet spot in the middle, but we also don't want to be in the toxic range. And where we can get into trouble as horse owners is a lot of times we think, well, if a little bit is good, more is better. That is not always the case. If you feed too much selenium, you will 
uh, interfere with proper hoof development in the horse and they're going to suffer and they'll have a toxicity. And there's different levels of toxicity for different nutrients. And you don't need to specifically know what all those levels are. Um, if you're feeding, you know, a, a feed from a reputable manufacturer, that's kind of their job, you know, as Purina, as a Purina nutritionist, that's my job to make sure I'm formulating a feed with the right levels of nutrients that are kind of in that optimal range. But where sometimes you can get into trouble is if you're starting to supplement extra here and there and everywhere, um, you know, things like vitamin A, I worry about selenium, I can worry about getting toxic. Um, but probably more likely is deficiencies um, where, you know, you're not meeting some of the needs, especially of some essential amino acids and then electrolytes, like we're talking about for performance horses. So going to just keep going up and up is not the thing. Um, there is a point where too much is not a good thing. So I kind of talked about sound feeding management, and this is so you don't need to have a PhD in nutrition to be able to figure out what are all these nutrients that my horse needs. Basically, you need to be able to read the feeding directions on your, your product. So whatever product you are feeding, a commercial product, a good reputable manufacturer will have very detailed feeding directions on the back of the bag or on the sewn-in feed tag. And if you go and look, you know, you need to have a good idea of the, the body weight of your horse and then look at the activity level. So like say you're a, a horse at moderate work, um, you know, the recommendation on this uh, bag for a thousand pound horse, you know, there's a minimum recommendation for hay. So 1.2% of body weight or 12 pounds of hay or forage per day. And then five pounds of this product, Ultium Growth. If you feed according to those directions, uh, minimally, um, and you know, there's always a range, right? You, know, you can feed a little bit more if your horse needs more calories, needs to put on a little more weight or feed a little bit less if he's, you know, doesn't need as many calories. You can be assured that that horse is getting all of his nutrient needs met by following these feeding directions. And, and as you can see, this is a really important part of feeding directions. Um, so there's a moderate work I was talking about, but in the fine print, um, there's see those little asterisks there. And there's one of the asterisks says, do not feed less than 0.3 pounds per 100 pounds of body weight per day to meet minimum protein, vitamin, and mineral requirements for maintenance. That is a really important statement to have on feeding directions. Basically, that says if you have a thousand pound horse, if you, if you feed less than three pounds a day, your horse may not be getting enough copper. He may not be getting enough zinc. He may not get, be getting enough essential nutrients. If you're above that minimum requirement, you sh your horse should be getting at least the minimum. Now, you know, if he's working hard, he's going to need more calories than that level would provide. Um, but if you find that you don't need that much feed, that's when you need to consider something like a ration balancer, which is a, a concentrated, you know, feed one pound a day, protein, vitamins, and minerals, and you're covered. So read the feeding directions and you don't have to be too concerned about meeting nutrient requirements if you follow the feeding directions. So there was that um, important statement. So let's talk a little bit about body condition. I think body condition can be overlooked sometimes. Um, basically, body condition score, you know, it's the Henneke condition score. If you're not familiar with it, you can read up on it and learn how to do it on your own horses. But it's a scale of one to nine. And we want our horses to be at a five typically, uh, but four to six can be acceptable. But if you get below a body condition score of four, um, this is problematic for a performance horse. The, the score is kind of a level of fatness of the horse and fat is actually a great source of stored energy. So when a horse has less than a four body condition score, the stored energy isn't there. Um, he's going to have decreased muscle mass because he's going to actually have to metabolize his own muscle to use for, for work um, when he has reduced energy stores. He's not going to recover well, and he actually uh, is going to have reduced cold tolerance, which causes more shivering, which will cause more calorie burning and cause him to lose even more weight. And then uh, kind of on the flip side, um, six and a half is getting a little too chunky. Um, this is a picture of a nice little hunter pony um, and some, you know, some disciplines want to see this fat cover, but unfortunately it's not always what's best for the horse. 
Um, when you get above a six body condition score, there's a lot of um, wear and tear on those ligaments and joints and muscles. Those horses uh, are not able to thermoregulate as well. They, and so then they can get overheated. And they also have an increased risk um, for metabolic issues like um, insulin resistance or laminitis. So keeping a horse closer to a five is, is better for performance and for long-term health. So the solution to you know, meeting requirements and maintaining body condition is to number one, select a balance feed that's correct for your age of your horse and the level of work you're doing with your horse and just follow the directions. It's really not that complicated. Um, the, the, the maybe more tricky part is to pick the right product that meets your horse's, you know, energy levels and, you know, all products will have different energy calorie levels and you can contact the manufacturer to ask that question, you know, what's the digestible energy of this feed and that'll give you a good idea. Um, and then follow the directions and then constantly be looking at the body condition score of your horse, um, every, at least every two months, if not more, um, and adjust your feed intake accordingly, you know, going up or down as needed. All right, so now let's talk about fueling that performance horse. So now, you know, you know how to meet their needs, nutrient needs, keep them at a good body condition score. And this is actually going to help you to decide what type of feed to feed based on what type of fuel it contains. And you can just think of fuel as energy. So, you know, you've got all sorts of different kind of race cars or, or cars out there, or vehicles, and each one of these vehicles is going to require a different type of fuel. You know, you're not going to put the unleaded gas you put in the Mini Cooper in that you know NASCAR race car that's supposed to go out and, and win the race. It, completely different types of fuel um, for the job. And, and it's the same thing with horses. Depending on their what they're doing, different fuels will supply um, the right types of calories. So let's talk about anaerobic exercise and kind of go back into science class and remember what anaerobic means. That means without oxygen. But this is the max intensity work. Basically, you know, it, it doesn't last very long, two to three minutes max. You know, that horse running full on gallop, those barrel horses. Um, and even, you know, for, for, for what, um, if you're on the trail, you know, maybe running up a hill, that is an anaerobic activity. It may only last, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. But if it's a full on effort, it's anaerobic. That horse is using blood glucose as a fuel during that activity, it, or, and then also glycogen, muscle glycogen that's stored in the muscle. It's burned really quickly, um, and they have to have some glycogen. So racehorses, as you can imagine, need a diet high in dietary carbohydrates because that's the only way they can replenish muscle glycogen. All right, so let's talk about the flip side, aerobic metabolism. And this is actually the majority of the work most of our horses do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's low intensity, long duration. Um, you know, maybe it's just, you know, 30 minute ride in the arena, or maybe it's an all day trail ride. Um, and that's definitely the primary fuel is going to be adipose stores and, you know, dietary fat. Certainly some glucose and glycogen is utilized uh, during um, aerobic metabolism as well. Um, but as you can see in this graph, a large percentage is coming from fat. So we do like to utilize fat in the diets of horses that are doing mostly anaerobic or mostly aerobic work. Um, so fat added feeds can be uh, a good addition to horses that are working for long periods of time. And this is just a graph from a, a research project that they were um, looking at how hard a horse works use, me by measuring their VO2 max, which is just a measure of the amount of oxygen that they, the maximum amount of oxygen they can take in at a certain level of work. And um, this is basically just showing that the harder the horse works, so 95% is basically almost maxed out, they're using almost all glycogen. But when they're low intensity down there at that 30%, the majority of the fuel is coming from fat. So this, there's been multiple studies that have kind of identified this 
which is now how we built these principles of feeding performance horses um, based on their job with a, you know, more glucose or glycogen or, or more fat. And, you know, like I said, all horses are gonna do a mix of both. So it's not like one or the other, um, but you can think about, you know, the majority of what you're doing. And when you're doing long distance riding, it's definitely gonna be aerobic metabolism. So how do you convert, where do these fuels come from? Not a lot of options uh, for horse diets. We've either got non-structural carbs, and that's going to come from grains and sweet feeds and anything um, with starch. You've got fermentable carbohydrates. So that basically comes from forage and fiber and also certain, certain ingredients like beet pulp um, are good in fermentable fibers as well. And then you've got your fats, you know, rice bran, soybean oil, um, other types of oils uh, are good sources of fat. And when it comes to glycogen, I mentioned glycogen is stored in the muscle. Those, that's a really important fuel source for anaerobic activity, and it can only be produced by dietary starch and sugar. So, you know, there's a, we hear a lot of, you know, emphasis talking about low starch and sugar diets, and that can be really important for horses that have metabolic issues, but for performance horses, Diet, some dietary starch and sugar is very critical because if a horse doesn't have enough starch and sugar in their diet to replenish glycogen, they're not going to have the fuel they need to perform um, to their potential. And so these, um, these images here are basically taken actually from a, a horse uh, that did a 50 mile endurance race and taken out of the middle gluteal muscle. They, they took a muscle sample biopsy at rest and the stain here uh, stains the glycogen in the muscle. And then after 50 miles, you can see that all of that muscle glycogen has been depleted. So um, of course, there, that horse will also be drawing on fat as energy too, but, um, but the glycogen is used up in that work and having some starch and sugar for glycogen replenishment is helpful. Now, you gotta have a caveat when you talk about starch, there is a limit, okay? Horses can digest starch really well, uh, basically until they can't. <laughs> um, we want starch to be digested in the small intestine and, and we've had, there's been quite a bit of studies looking at sort of what's that safe threshold of starch in a meal because, and this is some uh, graph here. They looked at, um, they had secretly cannulated horses so there's basically a, a cannula surgically implanted in the cecum of the horse where researchers could take samples of, of the starch level. And ideally, you would find no starch in the cecum. It all should be digested earlier in the tract in the small intestine. But there does come a point when that smart, small intestine becomes overwhelmed with starch. And that's where the graph starts to shoot up. And that's where that, that threshold is. So, you know, we want to avoid the starch in the hindgut. That can lead to laminitis, acidosis, you know, diarrhea, other problems. And that limit has been identified as net less than two grams of starch per kilo of body weight per meal. Now, I know that probably doesn't mean a whole lot, but I can give you a, a little graph here, or a, a, here is a table of what that kind of means in real life. So, I did the calculations, and so if you got your average, you know, 500 kilo horse or 1,100 pound horse, in one, so that threshold is would be three pounds of corn, which is a lot of corn. I will just say that, like, that's not not that I'm recommending you feed three pounds of corn, but that is what that level of two grams of starch per kilo of body weight. Anything less than three pounds of corn, the horse should be able to digest all of that starch in the small intestine. Then you go to something like oats. Oats has, has a lower starch content than corn. So it's a little bit larger, five pounds a day or five pounds a meal. I'm sorry, it's, this is per meal at one sitting. Then you go to Omelene 200, which is a sweet feed. Um, it's got a blend of corn and oats in it, but it's also got some other stuff in there too, some added fat. So it's even lower in starch. And then you go down the line till you get to the uh, a very low starch feed, Ultium. Theoretically, you would have to feed 22 pounds of a low starch feed like Ultium in one sitting to exceed the small intestine's ability to digest it. 
I'm not saying you should feed 22 pounds in a meal. That's that exceeds the stomach's capacity. But just the point being, the lower starch of feed contains, the quote safer it is uh, in terms of you know avoiding that starch getting into the hind butt, which is what we don't want. But a lot of people are surprised that the horse's small intestine can handle quite a bit of starch, you know, before it gets to be problematic for the hind gut. Now let's talk about fiber. You know, our horses are uh, should be on fiber first diets. The base of their diet is going to, going to be forage. Um, you know, whether that's hay or pasture. I mentioned beet pulp is a good source of fermentable carbs. All of these are necessary for proper hindgut health and, and proper function. And these fibers can be turned in, in a large intestine and they're fermented to volatile fatty acids. And that can be a large energy source as well for, for you know, horses daily energy needs. Up to 80% of a horse's maintenance energy needs can be provided by these volatile fatty acids produced by by forage and horse at maintenance, that may be the, all the energy that they need. If they're not exercising, they don't have a high energy requirement. Um, this can provide all the energy they need. So, um, however, if you've got a performance horse that's going out day after day and exercising kind of above and beyond their maintenance requirement, a fiber only diet is going to fall short. Um, and won't be able to support, you know, the workload because the horse will basically not have enough fuel to fuel that and refill glycogen. So fat is the third energy source. We love feeding fat to horses, right? It makes a nice shiny coat. Doesn't take much to do that. Just a couple ounces a day. Um, but the great thing about fat is that it is, um, very efficient. It doesn't take a whole lot. So two cups of oil is equal to one pound of fat. Um, you would need to feed three pounds of oats uh, to get that same amount of fat or two and a half pounds of corn. That's a lot of feed, but it only takes two cups of oil to provide a pound of fat for that. It's also lower heat. It's easy to digest. So the horse doesn't, when the fermenting of carbs or fermenting of fibers produces quite a bit of heat. Um, the, the digestion of fat doesn't. So it's actually something good to feed in the summer, uh, especially. And then, you know, again, feeding fat actually has what we call a glycogen sparing effect. So, you know, when you're feeding like a fat and fiber and, and, and some carbs in a feed, the horse is going to store the fat, he's storing the glycogen. Um, if the horse is adapted to using fat as fuel, the, the horse is going to, to uh, preferentially burn the fat and it's gonna spare that glycogen in the muscle until he needs to run up that hill. And then he will have some fuel in the tank in the glycogen. If he didn't have that fat in the diet and he wasn't metabolically adapted to it, he preferentially goes to that glycogen first. So that's what a glycogen sparing effect means. Um, when you feed fat, it can kind of spare that glycogen for when it's really needed. Now, one of the issues with fat, you can feed too much. Um, some horses don't like the taste, so feeding oil doesn't always, uh, a lot of oil doesn't always work, and that's why uh, a drier feed supplement like, like the Amplify, Purina Amplify, it's an extruded fat, it's 30% fat, it's a great high fat supplement, you can feed up to four pounds a day of it, it's 2,000 calories per pound, and horses like the taste, because straight oil, um, they do have a kind of a, they top out at a few cups a day usually. And then also the oil can affect fiber digestion negatively. It can coat kind of the, you know, hay um, leaves and actually reduce the, the fermentation of hay in the hindgut. Okay, so how do we uh, supply adequate and appropriate fuel? You want to feed carbs for high intensity work and glycogen replenishment, feed fat for long duration and low intensity work, and then you want to feed the right meal size to prevent hindgut acidosis, prevent that starch from getting to the hindgut. Um, and, you know, my rule of thumb on meal size is 0.5% or less of body weight. So like for a thousand pound horse, that would be a five pound meal or less. If you stay below that threshold, unless you're feeding straight corn, <laughs> um, you're pretty safe and not exceeding the small intestine's ability to digest starch.
Okay, supporting tissue growth. Now we're kind of getting into the, you know, let's maximize performance um, and, and prevent injury type um, talk. And we are really going to focus here on protein. So protein is really critical for performance horses. Protein is involved in almost every single function of the horse's body, you know, muscle, antibodies, you know, immunity, hair and hoof transport proteins and blood, hormones in, in your breeding animals. So protein, I can't understate or overstate the importance of good quality protein. And then certainly with exercise, you know, that is um, going to increase amino acid requirements also, but not all protein is created equal. You have high quality proteins and you have low quality proteins. The, probably the highest quality protein we can get is, is milk byproducts. So like whey protein, you're going to find that in, in some milk replacer products, but not in a lot of feed products, um, mostly because of it, it's very expensive. Um, but uh, soybean meal is actually a great source of amino acids too. It has a high level of lysine, threonine, methionine, which are three essential amino acids um, that typically aren't found in low quality sources like hay or even straight grains like oats. So um, just be aware, not all protein is created equal. Um, soybean meal probably being one of the, the best um, sources of a kind of a well-rounded amino acid profile that, that we'll use in the feed industry. It's, it's just such a great source of protein. Um, you, you can't really beat it. <laughs> So with, um, we don't want our horses to use protein as, as energy. They can, um, but it's metabolically expensive. But that's why when you see starvation horses, you'll see they have lost not only fat, but they have no muscle either. And that's because once the horse's body runs out of fat, then it starts to metabolize its own muscle. Now, really, uh, another key role of protein in the performance horse is recovery, especially coming back at day two day three, you know, every time a horse exercises, they create some micro tears in their muscle. To repair muscle, you need amino acids. Um, so that's where it comes into play. And they're, um, you know, talking about amino acids um, and repair, that is um, what led us several years ago to come out with a amino acid supplement uh, at Purina that's specifically for performance horses. We call it super sport. Um, and it actually is very rich in whey protein. I mentioned um, we don't usually put that in feeds because of the expense, um, but actually Super Sport does contain a significant amount of whey protein because it has such a good amino acid profile. And we did an extensive amount of research on it. We published it in the Journal of Equine Vet Science. Um, but this is uh, one of the findings that really excited me. I actually worked on this project myself. Um, we looked at how the horses, um, after we, we ran horses on a treadmill to exhaustion, basically a graded exercise test, uh, and looked at their creatine kinase um, levels in their blood. And creatine kinase, if you've ever had a horse that has tied up, you know this is something you don't want to see. <laughs> it's a muscle, it's an enzyme that's indicative of muscle damage. So the higher CK levels in the blood, the more muscle damage that has occurred because the muscles basically leak it out. And we had two groups in our study. One got alfalfa pellets and the other group got super sport pellets. They provided the exact same amount of crude protein. So the only difference in the horse's diets on the two, two test groups um, was the amino acid profile. And the horses that got the super sport after 24 hours of running basically to exhaustion on a treadmill, it takes about seven minutes. Um, it's a pretty intense trial. They, their CK levels are back to baseline but the horses on the alfalfa pellets, they were continuing to rise uh, significantly. And so that told us that their muscles were still kind of not recovering uh, as quickly as, as the horses on the super sport. So for me, um, when I work with high performance horses, I'm always talking about amino acid supplementation. I think it's a worthy, um, a worthy supplement to use when you're trying to support maximal muscle health. So, you know, when you're trying to support tissue growth, adaptation and repair, really uh, pay attention to protein, okay? And especially um, targeted amino acids. You know, I mentioned lysine, methionine, and threonine are kind of the three key ones. Um, 
but uh, protein is really important for, for this process. All right, let's talk about electrolytes. Um, chronic sodium depletion is bad. <laughs> Horses will actually drink less when they're sodium depleted, so that's not a good thing. Um, we know that it can contribute electrolyte deficiencies, you know, lead to poor performance. Um, we know that horses don't store electrolytes very well, so they need to be supplied daily. And how do you choose one? There's like a million on the market. Um, and it's pretty simple in terms of you want to look for high, you want to avoid high sugar, uh, low salt preparations, because that sort of defeats the purpose. Look for sodium chloride as the first ingredient on, on the label. That's It's really simple. You would be surprised if you go to the feed store and look at electrolytes. Um, many of them have either dextrose or sugar or some other ingredient other than salt as the first ingredient. Um, now, the sugar helps it to taste better. And I'm not saying sugar can't be in the preparation, but it just can't be first to really be an effective electrolyte. Um, here's kind of an example. I, this is an actual product on the, on the market. It's only 6.7% salt. Why would I want to feed an electrolyte that only provides, you know, less than 7% of the nutrient I'm looking for? I mean, the main electrolyte we want to replenish is sodium chloride. Yes, potassium is another important electrolyte, but if a horse is eating 1% of his body weight and hay, he's probably getting enough potassium from his forage, so, but he's not getting enough salt. So that's where the salt becomes really critical. Um, another, a better choice is the second one. You know, it's over 50% salt. Salt is first on the ingredient list. Yes, it's got dextrose or sugar, um, but that just makes sure that the horse will eat it. So supplement daily. You can use plain salt, you know, one to two tablespoons a day. Um, if the horse will eat that, it's great. Or a commercial preparation that has salt as the first ingredient. And then finally, um, sound feeding management. Um, there's just some basic feeding principles that if you follow them, you can kind of prevent a lot of potential problems in the future. Um, you know, you're, you want to feed a forage-based diet. The majority of the horse's ration should come from forage and roughage. And a minimum of 1% of body weight per day you know, definitely don't want to go lower than that, but ideally you'd be closer to 2%, if not more. Um, but grazing does count. I usually like to estimate if a horse is grazing about six hours of decent pasture, that's equivalent to about eight pounds of hay. Um, if horses are, you know, eating their hay too fast, I love using small hole hay nets. That's a great um, management tool and it better mimics grazing behavior because we don't want them to stand around with nothing to eat if they're in the stall um, with an empty stomach because that can lead to gastric ulcers. Um, you want to use concentrates as needed to provide energy. Supplements sparingly um, for very specific purposes, but they should not, you know, supply, they should not be like the mainstay of a horse's diet. Forage and then it concentrates for, for energy and nutrients and then supplements as needed. Um, but it, it should be, you know, a pretty simple equation there. And when you feed, feed by weight, not by volume. You know, you can get a, every scoop of feed weighs a little bit different. Um, this is just a list of a bunch of our Purina feeds. And as you can see, for the port weights are different. You can have something as low as well solved weight control at 2.6 pounds per quart. And um, very different than that, uh, Enrich Plus is 4.4 pounds per quart. So, you know, if I just tell you I've, I'm feeding a quart of feed or, you know, that's that could be a different weight depending on the type of feed. So just get a scale, know what your quart weighs or if it's your three quart scoop, know what that weighs and that helps you follow those feeding directions a little more accurately. And then a couple other tips about feed transitions. As a nutritionist, I get asked this a lot. <clears throat> and this is a big deal. You know, horses that are sensitive, especially, or have a history of colic, they're the ones you really have to watch. Um, but you want to introduce pasture slowly to, to any horse that's not used to pasture. And that's actually to prevent any type of founder or laminitis. And it's 
basically all about those hindgut microbes. We don't want to upset them. When you change from one hay to another, don't forget to go, you know, slowly there too. Excuse me. Um, a lot of people know, you know, you want to switch grains slowly, but the same can be said for hay as well. Um, and I use the rule of thumb on grain, um, try to make that transition slowly, approximately uh, one pound at a day. So if you're switching to five pounds of a new feed, you do that over five days. If you take a conservative approach, this can, you know, further promote digestive health, especially in these horses that have a history of digestive upset. Uh, Dr. Vineyard, we had a question about the uh, super sport supplement. Uh, Christian wrote, I do use super sport and add uh, fat supplement and outlast while in training competing. If I have a period of time where I won't be working competing uh, due to vacation or other things that interfere with the horse's work, do I keep my horse on the same diet or should I scale back and eliminate these extra additives? That's a great question. Um, so I would say a little bit that it depends, but probably, yes, you are going to make some um, changes, especially if your kind of downtime is going to be more than, I'd say, three weeks or a month. Um, so super sport, especially, I like to say it's sort of like a protein shake. If you're a couch potato and sitting there drinking a protein shake, but not doing anything else, you're not going to build any muscle. Same thing with horses. If they're not getting worked, um, really adding an amino acid supplement isn't going to be as efficacious. So if they're not doing anything, they probably can, uh, they probably don't need the super sport. The outlast is for gastric pH and for ultra prone horses. I would say it depends on the horse's history. If they're a high risk horse that has a history of ulcers, I would keep them on outlast year round. Um, but if, if they're not a high risk horse and you're kind of just, you know, doing it prophylactically, um, you could probably get away um, when they're not exercising. And if they're out grazing on the pasture 24 seven, they're probably okay. And then the Amplify is basically an energy supplement. So that would be, it depends too. Um, if they need the calories to keep their body condition, even when they're not being worked, probably need to still be on the Amplify. But if they only need those calories when they're working, um, you can probably back off on the Amplify during non-work times. I see this other um, question here um, about other amino acids as performance boosters, such as glutamine, beta alanine, and then carnitine as well, in conjunction with addition to branch chain amino acids. So oh, that's a really good question. So um, the research is limited on, in horses and amino acids when you come down to some very specific ones. Uh, the, the swine people, the, you know, the other a species have a lot more um, funding, basically, to talk to study these amino acids. Um, so when it comes to horses, we base a lot of what we think is true on other species studies. Um, now, let's see, you said glutamine. Um, we do know glutamine is really important for gut health. Um, the gut cells use glutamine as a direct source of energy. I love glutamine um, for horses, especially that have digestive issues. Super sport actually is pretty rich in glutamine and we've used that in horses with gut issues too, just because it's so rich in glutamine. Um, so, you know, some of the other beta alanine, I'm gonna have to say that's something, I'm not aware of any research in horses and, and, and what that is, is doing in the horse. There's probably some studies in, in humans on that. I'd have to go look it up. Um, and then carnitine, you know, carnitine is important in the amino acid or the, the carnitine shuffle, when you look at the mitochondria using energy or converting energy, um, I think they have tried to feed carnitine to horses and there's not really been any exciting changes there. Um, but it, it certainly is something that is effect, efficacious in humans and that's where it came from. They tried to feed it to horses, didn't have the same effect. I'm not sure if we know why. Um, and then branch chain amino acids, I think we're still learning, you know, what they are. There's a bunch of studies out there that don't show any effect. And then there's maybe one or two that's like, oh, maybe there's something. So um, that's what my answer would be. A lot of that is, you know, the research is limited. Uh, but we do know there that 
amino acids are, are important. It's just, we're not exactly sure how much the horse needs to actually have an effect or different effects. And it's gonna be different than humans. It's not gonna be the same. Okay, so let's um, move on to another kind of part of feeding management. I get asked this a lot um, in performance horses about when to feed in relation to exercise. And so <clears throat> we know, um, you know, there's a lot of different, I guess, theories or, you know, practices that people will like to follow. But, you know, based on kind of the physiology of the horse, what you feed the day of competition isn't really going to affect that horse's performance that day, except for just their ability to use the substrate that's already stored in their body. Like by the time you get to the day of competition, it's too late to build up their fat or build up their carbohydrate reserve. But what the day of competition feeding can change is sort of like the insulin and glucose response to a meal does have an effect on that horse's ability to like utilize that blood glycogen. So basically, if you feed a large grain meal within a three to four hour window of um, that exercise, it's going to cause gl glucose to go up and it causes insulin to go up. And that's um, kind of here, um, glucose and insulin are in the, in the blue and the, in the yellow that goes up. And, um, what, uh, you don't want to happen is that because that prevents the horse from being able to use uh, fat utilization, especially for long distance, like work, you want fat to be used as a, uh, a source of energy, but if insulin is high, that sort of down regulates the ability to burn fat. So ideally you would feed a larger grain meal at least four hours or more before the exercise starts. And that way you can kind of get the peak to go down and go, go up, go back down. And then it's low at the time the horse exercises, they can draw on the fat. It's not impeded, um, especially when your horse is doing aerobic work, which is what most of our horses are doing. So if you do need to feed within a, a three to four hour window, just feed a small meal, you know, two to three pounds at the most, nothing bigger. Um, but if they're eating a larger meal, make sure that's well before the start of exercise. Okay, so um, yeah, the sound feeding management, always make sure we're feeding enough forage, make sure you know what your feed weighs, make sure transitions are, occur slowly. And um, if you have to feed a large meal the day of exercise, make sure it happens uh, four hours prior to the start of exercise, just to make sure that their fat utilization can be maximized at the time of exercise. And I can tell you, <laughs> there are so many things out there uh, to choose from. You know, this is just Purina. You know, I work for Purina, so that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, but certainly, you know, there's a lot of other brands out there and there's a lot of other options. And what I would say is, you know, the feed tags are your friend when you're trying to make the right decision, you know, read feed tags, go to the manufacturer's website, see what that feed is, is made for, and then try to determine, you know, your horse's needs, if he needs high energy, if he needs lower energy, that's really kind of a good place to start is his energetic needs, and then go from there. And then always um, reach out, you know, at Purina, we have 1-800 number, we have, you know, our Facebook uh, chat where we support um, provide nutrition consult there and we also do it via our email and our website and we have you know trained nutritionists that basically are there to support you and you know oftentimes some of these questions come to me if it's something complicated and and the folks that are answering those questions need extra support I mean that's part of my job and, and I'm supporting them so um, and we actually have six PhDs um, on staff at Purina that that do the same thing so that's kind of what I would suggest. And oh, I should have removed that. I'm going to move that back. So one other thing I was remiss to add into this uh, slide, I meant to add the because this group and you guys are very, um, you know, you're out on the on the trail and I know you're, you know, taking horses out. And when we're talking about electrolytes and hydration, there's a brand new product that Purina, like we just came out with this summer. And I meant to put a picture of it in here and, and I forgot, 
but it's called Replena Mash. And um, you can pull it up and look at it on our website. But it's something that that I actually have gone to a couple of endurance rides and have taken it. And it is a great way to encourage a horse both to drink water um, and get, replenish their electrolytes. So basically, it's like a bran mash, but better. That's what I like to say, because it's made with ingredients that we're also using in feed. Um, but you, you use a pound, you add water to it. It replenishes the amount of electrolytes lost in 30 minutes. Um, it's really tasty. And we put a full dose of Outlast, which is the gastric support, um, pH support buffer in there. And if, if I'm trailering my horse and, or if I'm out, I'm, I have Replenish Mash with me now everywhere. The new horse that I just got, as soon as he got off the trailer, he got a meal of Replenish Mash. Um, I just think, you know, a lot of horses, they don't drink enough, especially when they're in a new environment or when they're stressed. And it's just a great tool if you're trying to get your horse to um, drink more, to get electrolytes in them, get some outlast in them, get a little bit of carbs uh, for some glycogen replenishment. It's a, it's a great little tool. It's not really meant to be fed every day. It's just meant to be fed as needed. So with that, um, I'm more than happy to answer any more questions if you have, guys have any or um, you're also welcome to reach out um, uh, after this. If you have more questions, I'm always happy to answer those as well. Uh, this is Bill. Um, I've got a question. It's often our riders are out. And it's we've we've had a lot of people talk to us about electrolytes, and we're a, a lot of us are pretty good at working on keeping our horse well electrolyted. Some of our riders, when we're out riding, when they're out for 20 or 30 miles in the day, um, they'll carry grain with them. It, it's on a on a practical basis on a kind of a grain or sweet feed or whatever for a long distance horse we're working aerobically is there it's other than a treat to the horse is there much value in a in a in a grain we're making them eat grass along the way to try to keep their gut sounds going but from an energy point of view it sounds like we definitely don't want to give them a sugar hit um, I'm wondering what an appropriate grain would be like during, uh, to try to kind of keep them going during the ride. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think it's going to vary a little bit from horse to horse because the primary, we, it is a good idea. If the horse has an appetite to want to eat some calories, I mean, that's what we want to do. You know, fill them up with some calories in order to replenish that, you know, to just keep them going. But you can't, what you feed that day is nothing compared to what you've been feeding two months leading up to that ride, um, especially, you know, in terms of fat storage and glycogen storage. But yeah, we want them to eat if they will. So number one, feed them what they'll eat. Um, if it's only going to be a pound or two, I think is that, that if it's a sweet feed, if it's two pounds of a sweet feed, is that going to interfere with their fat utilization? That's a small enough meal where I, I don't think two pounds is problematic, but something more than that could be. Um, if they're going to eat a fat added feed, that would be, a, I really like only 400 uh, for Ryan Durant's riders on the, on the trail. Only 400 is a beet pulp based complete feed. So you've got the good fiber to keep those gut sounds. You, it's fat added. It's got Amplify built in it. So it's getting good, some extra fat calories. And then there's some oats in there for, you know, a little, little bit of energy too. So and it's tasty. Horses love Amelie 400. I always say if a horse won't eat Amelie 400, they're probably dead. So it kind of checks all the boxes for me. But um, really, the, the best answer to your question is, is what the horse is going to eat uh, in that scenario. And I think that is a little bit different for every horse. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I have a, I see this question about replenish for IR horses. Very good question. So <laughs> I hate saying this, but it's always true. It depends. So it's about 25% non-structural carbohydrate. The recommended feeding meal size is one pound. So one pound at 25% carb is actually not that high. So yes, it's gonna be safe for most IR horses that are well controlled. If you have a horse that's uncontrolled insulin or they're actively laminitic, no, we would not recommend it. Um, but if they're a well-controlled kind of metabolic horse, um, it, it's actually going to be less sugar and starch than like five pounds of, of hay. So um, yes, do we have the ESC plus starch percentages for replenish? That's um, 
on our, I think, like I said, it's around 25%. I can give you uh, the exact number if I pull it up right now. Give me one second. You would think I would know this stuff off the top of my head, but um, we have a lot of products. So occasionally, all right. So the ESC is 11% and the starch is 145 so, okay, it's 25.5% non-structural carb. And like I said, it's a pound uh, is the feed, recommended feeding rate. Good question. All right. Gluten. Yeah, if your horse is not controlled, you we don't recommend it. But if you compare it to... Um, the amount of sugar and starch in five pounds of hay, you'd actually be surprised. Not that much different. We'll give people another minute to type in some questions. And, sure. But Dr. Vineyard, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight and taking taking your time out of your evening. Um, we really appreciate this. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity and um, let me know if you have any more questions in the future. I'm not seeing any other questions. So I'm just, again, gonna say thank you. Um, we really appreciate this. Um, for everybody else, I do wanna say this is the last webinar um, in our 2022 series for this year. And we will be starting the webinar series up again, hopefully in January or February of next, of, uh, next spring. Uh, thank you everybody for attending and have a good night. Good night.